as historians become more conversant in using big data sets to tell more complete stories about the past, it might be that the lessons of the past can be applied more fully to how we understand urban form in the future. My name is uh, Gabrielle Esperdi. I am a professor of architecture at the New Jersey Institute of Technology in the Hillier College of Architecture and Design, where I've taught since 2001. I am an architectural and urban historian whose work looks at metropolitan landscapes in the 20th and 21st century. In 2019, I published my second book with the University of Virginia Press, American Autopia. The project emerged almost directly out of my first book, Modernizing Main Street, which dealt with the sort of commercial thoroughfares that ran through compact small towns. In that project, which looked principally at architecture and urbanism in the 1930s, the car was a minor player. And in American Autopia, the car becomes a key player. If I think about the most important contributions that American Autopia makes, it is to reframe the way in which we think about how architects and planners have engaged with the automobile, to recognize that architects have been grappling with this problem almost from the moment that the first Model Ts kind of rolled off of the assembly line in Highland Park in Michigan. There's been a tendency to think about the singular impact of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown that we know through their work learning from Las Vegas. But in fact, they were building on this foundation of thinkers and designers who had been looking at the impact of the automobile on conventional urban space, but also as it was increasingly be, being understood at mid-century as a kind of expanded landscape, pushing us to understand that what's happening on the urban periphery is just as significant as what was happening in our traditional downtowns. That's perhaps what I'd like to hope is the most uh, significant contribution. The sort of central and animating ideas of American Autopia is that there was a period in the middle of the 20th century when architects and urban designers believed in the very notion of Utopia as a perfect place. So they believed somehow with the right engagement with the built landscape that we would achieve a balance of people, of cars, of built form. Yeah. And when I started the project, I had assumed that that was over. As I continued my research, and by the time the book finally came out, I realized that the laudatory discourse that surrounded discussions of the urban impact of autonomous vehicles and of electric vehicles was in fact an extension of what we could think of as this early automobile utopian period. And so for me, concluding the book with a, a sort of caution to look in the rearview mirror is intended to say, look, it's never going to be about a technology solving larger urban issues. And the car and any of its later iterations, no matter how clean they are, they're not going to solve what is in some ways principally a social problem. We tend to look at a place like Los Angeles and read its attenuated urban form as predicated on the automobile. As a historian, it's important to note that the attenuation of LA's urban form had its origins in the streetcar line. The streetcar lines tended to favor a horizontal density simply because the streetcars went down major arterial boulevards. As the car took over from the streetcar, it led to a kind of dense fabric that moved away from the principal corridors themselves. It's simply because the car could virtually go anywhere that we were willing to build an infrastructure that supported it, we found that built form followed it. We understood a new kind of urban form that was principally horizontal rather than, as we conventionally have understood it for much of the 20th century, as being vertical. If we are thinking about a kind of post-autopia future in which there are new urban forms that are generated post-automobile, in some ways I think it is going to look the way we live now. We're going to continue to have forms of density that are both vertical and horizontal. There will always be the need for a dense fabric of someplace like Manhattan, but far more places look like the density that exists in Los Angeles. And so it may be about looking at how that field condition of density 
can be remade through an investment in public transportation rather than in private automobiles. For several years now, I have been fortunate to be a part of a research group at the Getty Research Institute that is looking at the kind of scholarly and aesthetic value of Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles project that of course begins with his now iconic book, Every Building on the Sunset Strip. What began as a work of conceptual art has become over the course of more than half a century, incredibly useful urban archive, a kind of Google Street View Avant La Lettre, albeit a selective urban street view, given the boulevards that Ruscha tended to document, which were principally in West Los Angeles, and hence there are all kinds of socioeconomic racial complications with dealing with the archive. The digitization of even a small portion of the Ruscha archive is allowing me, working with a machine learning specialist at Yale, to begin to use these images as a way of tracking stasis and change in the built environment of Los Angeles. We realize that while of course much has changed, even more has stayed the same. And that we can think of the change as almost a sort of sonography, so that there's a, a kind of surface transformation of street level occupation that is reflected in signage and things that are evident through the storefronts. Only more subtly do we begin to track the actual change of built form. I've been teaching at Polytechnic since 2001, and what I gradually realized is that I found the perfect home for the kind of work that I was interested in, which was always, even before I knew what the digital realm was, it was about aggregating a kind of architectural data in order to tell a different set of stories. And, and so for me, that started with looking at Main Street storefronts as they were modernized in the 1930s. Individually, they were utterly insignificant, but when you brought them together as a group, you realized, wow, there was this profound transformation that happened in commercial landscapes in the United States, but because it was largely a kind of ephemeral architectural production, we didn't really have a way of tracking it. This moment that we're in now in terms of digitized collections and the creation of a vast array of digital information is allowing us to see patterns that we didn't know to look for, or we can take things that we know existed anecdotally and to see what happens when we run those through increasingly large data sets. I think it's going to allow us to tell richer and more complex stories about the way that capitalism or philanthropy or the distribution of building materials shaped the built environment which isn't new, right? If we go back to someone like Rainer Banham, who argued that the Sears catalog was the most significant architectural document that existed, precisely because you could take a Sears catalog, you could look at the distribution network that existed and see the impact that it had. And certainly historians who tracked the existence of Sears kit houses have begun to do that. The impact of data sets and neural networks is gonna be profound in terms of our understanding of the past and the present. What I wonder about is the impact that it's going to have on the future. If in fact we start using swarm models to look at the way that pedestrians move and to think about the way that that's going to have an impact on the way we interact with buildings. In some ways it's ironic because historians tend to be late adapters to technology. As historians become more conversant in using big data sets to tell more complete stories about the past, it might be that the lessons of the past can be applied more fully to how we understand urban form in the future. Even projects that have digitized all the redlining maps that actually show us those places that were targeted for disinvestment from the late 30s through the period of urban renewal, the digitization of those is astonishing and it allows us to actually track what we knew in our guts, right? We all knew where those redlined neighborhoods were. We all could tell the story individually. Now we have the ability to tell those stories at a much higher level. One other project that I think it's useful to mention is my work with SAH Archipedia. I'm the founding editor of this digital publication of which the Buildings of the United States print series is a part. We're actually 
right now kind of merging the two projects into a single a publication that is both digital and print because it is organized much like a conventional architecture guide was with introductory essays and then individual building entries it allows for every building to in essence take center stage even if we don't know a lot about it the beauty of a digital publication is that we can pinpoint it on a map, we can upload the information we do have, and we can put it into some kind of a context. It's a kind of documentation project. And the more we document in the built environment, the richer our understanding of its past and its future is going to be. If we train ourselves as historians, as critics, as planners, and as architects to look at every building and to see every building as an embodiment, not just of material form, but of human occupation, then place will be richer for it. I see the historical project as being one that is essential to understanding the way where we live now works.